and Curtis Carlo, who's portfolio manager at Canaccord Genuities Team LWC. Thanks so much for joining me on the desk. My pleasure. I saw you kind of roll your eyes a little bit on that theory that maybe rising rates are what's stimulating the economy. Yeah, I mean, tell that to a variable rate mortgage holder here in Canada and they'll kind of laugh, laugh that, off, that one off because of, you know, the pain that they're experiencing that. And I think that's the biggest difference between our two economies. I mean, they have 20, 25 euro amortization mortgages, our, ours max out at five. So I think that's a big concern we have with the U.S. or the Canadian economy in the months to come. Oh, not amortization, but terms. Terms, right? terms yes, yeah. Right. Um, what do you expect Powell to say that. I mean, the markets are not doing anything right now, even as they're selling off in Europe. So very clearly kind of waiting to see what's Powell going to say about inflation? What's he going to say about the markets? Looks like they're pricing out a rate cut this year. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about this since the start of the year when they were pricing in six cuts this year. We've been fading that trade. Um, you know, the WARP program on our terminal shows you that average rate, but there's a lot of kurtosis in that. It's really two camps, rate cuts and pause or rate hikes at some point. I mean, the U.S. economy is clipping along, unemployment's low, gross high, um, creating more and more jobs than expected every single month. So it puts Jim in a really tough spot to try to, you know, cut rates this year. Um, what do you think the probability is that we don't get a rate cut? And are you even thinking about rate hikes? At this point, we're firmly in the, in the rate pause camp to okay. wait and see what the data shows. I mean, it's like steering the Titanic. You got to kind of move before the, before you get there. Um, but just growth has just been so strong and robust. Um, I don't know if these rate hikes are helping the economy. And I mean, they are meant to lower inflation. But with oil in the mid 80s, um, you know, that that rolls down into many, many aspects of our economy. The real economy, you're absolutely right. Does this dent, maybe that combined with higher oil prices, does this dent a pretty robust equity rally, certainly south of the border? And it's getting, getting, getting kind of started in the TSX. Yeah, I mean, we saw volatility spike to the highest level on the VIX yesterday that we've seen so far this year. Um, and I think that you would probably see some equity market weakness should the, the term hike be brought back on the table um, or back onto that work uh, function on our Bloomberg terminals. But, you know, you can think back to 2023, the S&P was up over 25 percent. We experienced two 10 percent declines. You know, market volatility is why I have a job. We're here to uh, play the swings and we move around our portfolios to, to ta use tactical asset allocation uh, to pos position for these types of, cha of changes. Let's use the banks as maybe an example of that. We're seeing quite an interesting um, bifurcation in what's going on with the financials. The big money center banks seem to be struggling or at least throwing a, a, enough, enough caution out there to have investors selling those stocks like a JP Morgan or a Bank mm -hmm. of America. But your Morgan Stanleys, your Goldman Sachs that just do well in capital markets, those are thriving. Both capital markets and wealth management have been standout sectors for the U.S. banks this quarter. Um, you know, we saw that with Goldman yesterday, a position we added to in October of last year. Um, and I think that that's here to stay. I mean, asset management grows as the stock markets lift higher. And I think something that we'd expect to see into the Canadian bank and uh, independent wealth management firm earnings this year um, and I think those with the larger wealth management investment banking divisions uh, should do well. Like what? Name some names. I don't know. Are there any independents out there that focus on wealth management <laughs> and banking? I uh, don't know. Who signs your checks again? Uh, there might okay, be. so it can accord. Um, but out of the big banks, do you see that that filters in and yeah, I mean, are we, they going to be hobbled by other issues? We own TD for that very, very same decision. Um, we own BMO, both very strong in wealth as well as investment banking, both domestically and south of the border. Uh, and I think should should be a boon from what we've seen from the earnings report so far. OK, but going back to the rate conversation, I think we've largely heard from Tiff Macklin, who says kind of maybe no surprise that both central banks need to feel confident that we're clearly back on a path to 2% before reducing rates. Um, he says that today's inflation numbers were positive, but reiterates his comments from last week that the Bank of Canada needs to be sure of that path before acting. That was a comments from Tiff Macklem. Jerome Powell speaking now. Let's just listen in. Moving into better balance over the past year. Uh, the ratio of job openings to unemployed workers was extremely elevated in 2021 and 22, has now moved back down to levels just above the pre-pandemic era. Surveys of workers and businesses indicate a normalizing labor market. So do the rates of both quits and hires. 
uh, and uh, broader wage pressures also continue to moderate, albeit gradually. So the overall picture for the labor market is one of real strength, but gradual normalization. Turning to price stability, uh, our inflation mandate. Inflation, of course, declined quite significantly over the second half of last year, over the whole year, but particularly in the second half. But 12-month core PCE inflation, which is uh, one of the most important things we, we look at, is estimated to have been little changed in March over February at 2.8%, and the three and six month measures of inflation are actually above that level. So we've said at the FOMC that we'll need greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2% before it would be appropriate to ease policy. You know, we took that cautious approach and uh, sought that greater confidence so as not to overreact to the string of low inflation readings that we had in the second half of last year. Uh, the recent data uh, have clearly not given us greater confidence and instead indicate that it's likely to take longer than expected to achieve that confidence. That said, we think policy is well positioned to handle the risks that we face. If, if higher inflation does persist, we can maintain the current level of restriction for as long as needed. At the same time, we have significant space to ease should the labor market unexpectedly weaken. Right now, given the strength of the labor market and progress on inflation so far, it's appropriate to allow restrictive policy further time to work and let the data and the evolving outlook guide us. Come what may, we remain strongly committed to returning inflation over time sustainably to 2%. Well, thank you. I think that's a, a really important frame for our discussion today. Um, one of the things that I remarked on when I first got into public life was how often I saw my international peers uh, as, I, as we moved around. And when I see the two of you on stage together, I know that often you uh, see each other at G7, at G20 meetings. And I think it would be quite interesting for the audience to understand you know, how collaboration happens or doesn't happen internationally, mm -hmm. how central banks work together uh, or don't work together. So uh, you know, maybe I could ask you, Jay, to give a perspective on, on how, that, uh, how that happens from, from, uh, from your vantage point. Sure. So um, to, to give you an idea, we do meet quite regularly. So uh, Tiff and I attend uh, two G7 min uh, meetings per year for ministers, that's finance ministers and central bank governors. We don't attend the leaders meeting, but we attend I, in the United States, but we attend the meetings with the finance ministers, which, which Bill was, and also two G20 meetings. So that's two, that's four meetings per year right there. We also have six meetings uh, at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. One of those is now virtual, but we're in, and, and that's only central bankers, no finance ministries. So it's all central banking uh, stuff, and you know, it's it's economics, it's financial regulation, all those things. We also come here to Washington, or every third year we go someplace else, twice a year for the IMF World Bank meetings, which is kind of what everybody's doing in Washington right now. So it's a lot of meetings. What do we do at these meetings? Um, <laughs> fair question. Essentially, uh, Here we, we have the central Jerome bankers, Powell are Powell speaking are about the relationship that he has with Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem, um, which is interesting, and we will continue to monitor that for developments. But it's important to take a look at the market reaction to something that Jerome Powell said that sent the markets lower. Not only sent the equity markets lower, but if you take a look at the reaction in the bond market as well, you're seeing yields uh, rise significantly, particularly on on the two-year end of the curve, the two-year hitting a yield of 5%. So equities falling, bonds also selling off. Why? It was likely the statement where he says it's going to take longer for confidence um, on, on the path of inflation after recent data. Uh, and I think the fact that the length of time is being referenced and that it's going to take longer was being viewed as bearish. Chris Curlo of uh, Canaccord Genuity is still with me on the desk. I feel like there was something bullish in that he didn't say if it goes, if it continue, if inflation continues to, to move higher, he said we can maintain rates in restrictive territory. And I thought, is he going to say hike? Yeah. And he didn't. He said we can maintain rates, but investors focusing on longer. It's going to take longer to deal with inflation. Yeah, that's really been the story all year, that just pushing out that expectation for that first cut. Uh, I mean, he probably pushed it a little bit further there as you viewed on like the pullback briefly following that remark. I think it would be a pretty big move for him to bring the hike talk into the conversation. Um, 
you know, it's they. Is this the first opening salvo <laughs> to that, perhaps? It could be. I mean, I think that it's got to start to come on the table, and expectations are building. I was reading uh, some data; it could be as high as 20% chance that we see a hike before a cut at this point. Uh, that was down to zero when we saw the pause originally late last year. I want to take a look at just quickly, if I could, um, the Canadian dollar against the U.S. dollar, because you also saw um, the Canadian dollar come under pressure as those comments came out. Um, and again, that would affect because it looks like, at least markets are pricing in, June could be live for the Bank of Canada. Do you think Powell's comments kind of rolled it out for the U.S.? Probably rolled it out for the U.S. I mean, I think expectations now for inflation in Canada is to get close to that target by the end of the year and certainly inside of it in 2025, which opens the door for the Bank of Canada. But we start moving not in tandem. That's not going to be great for the Canadian dollar, um, which, you know, is under pressure despite relatively supportive commodity complex. Are you worried that the rally here could could really struggle. I mean, we've already seen a, a 3% move down in the S&P 500. We've now closed below a 50-day moving average. Corrections are very normal. Um, could this be the start of one? It very well could be. I mean, it's a repricing of expectations in the market. We saw a rally from mid-late October last year. I don't think I've saw the S&P break the 20-day moving average up until this most recent bout of weakness, which is almost unprecedented, to bring that word back. But um, to have that type of pullback, we're still too early for us to be buyers on this dip. We raised some cash in March ahead of you know this ongoing strength that's just been on the back of multiple expansion. We just came off two years of barely zero earnings growth. Expectations are that we are going to see some this year, but are people willing to pay the same for a dollar of earnings next year as they are today? Uh, you know, we're kind of high on that PE ratio, historically speaking. Chris, 